Hello everyone, welcome back to another example video. Before we begin, I just want to say I hope that you guys are doing well and having a fun time in structural engineering. Now in a previous example, we calculated the second order or p-delta effects of the steel frame shown here using hand calculations and a simplified analysis method presented in CSA S16. Now for this analysis method to work, we actually had to do two first order analysis, one for gravity loads and one for translational loads. Now in the hand calculation example, I didn't actually do the analysis by hand, I just said I did it in S-frame, and I didn't show you guys how exactly we did it. In this example here, we are going to go into S-frame, and we are going to conduct those two first order analysis required for the simplified stability analysis method in CSA. So sit back, relax, grab a drink, and let's jump into S-frame. Alrighty, so when you open up S-Frame and click a new 2D model, you'll be greeted with this screen here. And this is basically the preliminary work you have to do before you actually start defining your model. Uh, the first thing here, as we can see, is just some project titles or a description of the project. Of course, I just filled out CSA S16 frame analysis uh, for my structural description, a single story steel frame, and I just put my name down as the engineer. So you guys can put really whatever you want here. It doesn't matter too much. It's not going to affect anything in the scheme of things. Uh, after you fill out whatever you want, you can click next. And then the next section is going to be our input units. So being Canadian, of course, we have millimeters, kilonewtons, all those fun things. Uh, these are the default settings, and this is what I like to leave it as. Uh, this is probably the most friendly for a typical analysis. Of course, if you're doing a special kind of analysis where we have really small displacements and really small members, Maybe you want to change it up a bit, but for the most part, this is going to be good. So I'm going to go next again. Uh, the next part is our result units or our output units. Uh, we want displacements in millimeters. Our forces are going to be in kilonewtons. So again, this is fairly typical, not too bad. So I'm going to leave it as default yet again. Click next. Modeling options. So of course, this is a finite element program. There is going to be some error associated with some things. But in this example, we are doing a linear analysis, so the air is not going to be too much. You don't have to worry too much about this specific thing. So, of course, I just like to add a couple extra zeros, but for this example, it's not going to impact too many things. So I'm going to go next after this. And then the last thing is what building codes do you want? So for the building code, we have NBCC 2015. That's the latest building code in Canada. And of course, this is going to impact things like your loads. Uh, we have the concrete design code, so our latest one is CSA A23.3 2014 version. Again, most up to date. And then, of course, for steel, we have two different ones. We have the steel database, which is going to be quite important because, as we saw in the example, we have to define some sections. So, this database right here is going to contain all the sections that we want. And then, for our design code, we have CSA S16 19. Again, that's going to be the latest version of our steel code. So everything looks good here. I am going to go next. And then of course it gives us some options. We can start a new model from scratch or we can kind of go with some already designed models. But of course we are going to start a new model from scratch. So notice that next is now kind of blacked out. We can actually go to finish. So from here we can actually start creating our model. So once you're done all that preliminary stuff, this is what you'll be greeted with. And this is how we are going to create our model. As we are going to see, there's going to be basically three tabs that we are going to be interested in. The first one is geometry. So this is where we will define our model geometry. It's where we will define our member sections, all that fun stuff. From there, we will go on to loads, where we define the loading that we want to apply to our model. And finally, we have the graphical settings. So once we actually analyze our model in this tab right here, this is where we are going to actually look at our results. But of course, we can't look at that right now because <laughs> we have nothing defined. So I'm going to go up to geometry, and this is where we are going to start. The first step in creating one of these models is just laying out the frame. Okay, so we're not going to assign section properties. We're not going to assign boundary conditions. We just want to create our frame. And to do that, we need to start out with the node. So as we can see in the tab here, we have many different options. But if we look at this first one right here, which is just a dot, this is called the joint tool. So this is where we can define nodes. And nodes are basically parts of our frame where two members intersect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this right here, and it gives us the option up here to define where these joints are going to be. 
So by default, it'll be zero and zero, and I'm going to go okay. So as we can see on the screen here, we've now defined a joint at the location zero comma zero. But again, to us right now, this really doesn't mean too much. What I want to do is I want to create a second joint and then make a member connect between the two joints. So as we can see here, if this was the very left side of my model, we know that we would have a column rising upwards at a distance of six meters. So what I can do is I can create another joint somewhere up here at a distance of six meters. So the X coordinate is going to stay the same because we are going to create a vertical member. But now we know that our Y coordinate is going to be six meters. So I can go OK. And as we can see, if I zoom out, we now have two joints. We don't actually have a member between them yet, but we have the two joints or the ends of the member. To create a member between them, what I can do is I can go down one step to this member definition tool. So when I click that, as we can see, the top screen here now changes. And we have many, many different options to define a member. The most simplistic one is two joints. So if I define the two end joints of the member, all I can do is I can click this two joints, I can go OK, and then I can just select the two joints to create a member. So if I select the bottom joint as well as the top joint, I now have a member between them. So this is going to be my column. So if you guys want, you guys have the option of going back to the joint tool and defining joints for every location where two members intersect, and then come down to the member tool and basically add members between those joints. But that takes a while. No one wants to <laughs> be inputting in a bunch of joints. So S frame also gives us a very nice option of a one joint tool. So basically from here, we can define a member using one joint. And as we can see, we have many different options here. So basically all I need to do is start with a joint. And let's say we have this joint right here. And we know that from our model, we have a horizontal beam kind of coming out to the right. So what I can do is I can say, okay, if my member is going directly to the right, I can go to this tool right here, which is going to add a member in the positive X direction. So all I need to do is I can select the positive X direction and then specify the length of that member. In this case, we know that our member is going to be eight meters in length. So I can go eight meters, positive X direction. And when I go OK, I can just click on this one joint. And as we can see, it now creates the other member. Now what's nice for us is once you start doing this, you can create frames rather quickly because we know that the next horizontal member is also eight meters. So I can just click again. And we know that the third horizontal member is also eight meters. So I can just click again. So as we can see, we created three members rather quickly. I didn't actually have to go manually input these joints, which is great for us. Anything that saves time is great. So now if we look at this, we have our first column and we have our three horizontal beams, but we know that we have to add three more columns right here. What's nice is we have already defined one of the joints for these columns. So what I can do is I can use the one joint command again and basically specify a member going in the negative Y direction. So before we had positive X, well, I'm gonna go over to negative Y. And then all I have to do is specify the length of that member which we know is six meters. All of our columns are six meters. From there, I go over to OK, and then I just have to select the joint. So I'm gonna go one, two, and three. So as we can see, we have now defined the complete geometry of our single story frame. It's actually that simple. Again, there's many ways of doing it, but whatever works best for you. Another option, which I'll just show very briefly, because I don't wanna get into it. I, I don't personally use it, but who knows, maybe you prefer it, is we can go up here to grid lines. So if I select grid lines and it popped off on another screen, what I could have done is I could have added grid lines to my model. And if this is the case, I could have actually defined members between the grid lines. So you could have done that if you guys wanted to. Again, I personally don't like the grid lines. I find that they overlap the members and I can't really see them as well. So I always leave it as none. But if you wanted to, you could have defined grid lines and then you could have defined the members between the grid lines. Completely up to you. So, so far we now have our moment resisting frame. But the next problem that we have to consider is in our actual problem, only this bay right here on the very left is a moment resisting frame. We know that these two columns are lean on columns. Why is that? Because we have pins here and we have pins here. 
In S-Frame, by default, all of these members are rigidly connected. So if I were to just leave the model right now, this is a moment resisting frame, this is a moment resisting frame, and this is a moment resisting frame. We need to eliminate the moment at these locations. How do we do that? Well, we go down a little bit to this right here. It kind of looks like a little scepter to me, but this is the member release tool. So if I were to click this tool, and by default everything is good to go, I can just go OK. I can now select the locations where I want to release moments. Now we know that there's going to be four locations at each end of this beam and at each end of this beam. So if I were to click it right now, as we can see, we now have that little red line popping up showing us that we have now added basically a hinge at these locations. So I'm going to add one here, I'm going to add one here, and now I'm going to add one right here. So this is great because now we have the complete geometry of our frame defined. We have our moments released at the places of interest. The only thing we have to do now, or basically the two things we have left, are going to be adding those supports as well as adding the sectional detail. So if we were to just kind of keep going down this list, the next one that we would have right here is Section Properties Tool. So if I were to click this right now, as we can see, nothing really has a sectional property. They're all just listed simply as S1. What's nice in S-Frame is it has the complete steel database accessible to us. So if we wanted to, we can go up here. So there's a button right here that says Edit Section Properties. I'm going to kind of Highlight it a little bit so you guys can see it. I know S-Frame interface can be a little bit small at times, but if you click it and it came up on a different side, side, you will be given this menu right here. So as we can see, we actually haven't defined any sections in our model thus far. But what I can do is that I can say, you know what, I have steel sections. And on this tab right here, there is steel. So if I were to click this, it pops up on the other monitor, but if I were to bring it over, we now have a bunch of steel sections we can add to our model. So by default, it'll be in the CISC database, which is what we want as Canadians. And then we have the different section names. So I know that I am looking for a W shape or an I section. So I have it right here. If you wanted an HSS section, something like that, you can click down HSS and you have all the different options. But again, I want a W shape. And for our beams, we have a W460 by 97. So what I would do under section name is I would just scroll down until I find the W460 by 97. So scroll, 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 getting closer. Oh, here's 460, 460 by 97. What I do is I click it right here. And then since I want to use this section, I'm just going to go add to. So this will basically bring it into my model. But this is not the only section that I want. We know that our columns are mainly W310s by 97. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my tab. I'm going to go down to W310 by 97 right here. I'm going to click on that and I'm going to add that to my model. Now the last thing too, of course, is we know that one of our columns is a W310 by 179. So I'm going to go back to here. I'm now going to scroll up until I find the W310 by 179. I'm going to click it and I'm going to go add two. So notice now it is technically made a list of all the sections that I want to bring into my model. So I'm going to go OK. So from here we now have three sections in our model. Now one last thing before we actually start assigning sections, and this is something that will help you remember what they are, is we can actually define colors for these sections. So notice if I were to put this to the side, all of our sections are in black. And if we leave it that way, as we can see by default, all of them are black. It's very hard to distinguish one section from another. So what I like to do is I like to just give them some color. Let's say that our beams are going to be pink. Let's say that most of our columns are going to be this light blue. And let's say that our one member column is going to be green. So now as we can see, it's defined as green, it's defined as blue, and it's defined as pink. So what I'm going to do, now that I have all this defined, I can just close it. And by default, it will assign all of the members in our model the default section. So right now, as we can see, everything is now a W460 by 97, everything. If I want to change some of the members, so in this case, I want to change the columns, all I have to do in this menu right here, and if you don't have this menu, 
all you have to do is go here. So I can go on, I can go off. All I have to do is just click the one I want. So right now I have the W310 by 97 and I just need to highlight all the columns that I want. So we know that this column as well as these two columns are those W310s. So all I need to do is just highlight them. So here's one very important thing. I did this on purpose so you guys can see. If I were to highlight it like this, it doesn't work. If I were to highlight going towards the right, I need to select the entire member. So if I just went through the cross section, it didn't work. But if I select the entire member, it works. However, if I were to go to the left, so remember, in this case, I was going to the right, nothing happened. But if I were to go to the left, as we can see, it now selects anything it touches. So if you're highlighting going to the right, you have to select the entire member. If you're highlight going to the left, you just need to touch that specific member. So as we can see, we have now defined our three columns as W310s by 97. I'm gonna go down to the green one because we know that this column right here is a W310 by 179. So I'm just gonna go to the left so I don't need to highlight the entire thing. And as we can see, we have now defined sections to each one of our members. So everything is going pretty good so far. The last thing that we need for geometry is going to be these supports. But before we get to there, I just wanna highlight one thing. It doesn't matter for this particular example, but if you wanted to change the properties of the sections, it would just be in this dot down below. So as we can see, it's material properties tool. If I were to click it, as we can see by default, everything is defined as steel. Now it's important that this steel is actually also defined as linear elastic. So it has a Young's modulus of 200,000 MPA and there is no yielding or anything like that. And for this example, we are doing a linear analysis. So that makes perfect sense. We are actually good to go. But now what we want to do is we want to define our pins at the bottom of our structure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to the support tool, which is just one below it. And to add pins, it's very simple. We have three options right here. And basically what you want to do is depending on the support condition that you want to add, you are just going to select what you want. So as we can see, we are currently restraining translation in X, translation in Y, as well as rotation in the Z axis. So if I were to actually just put it on right now, that's a fixed support. We don't want a fixed support. So here comes the next little tidbit of information. If I want to remove something that I've defined, all I have to do is hold down control and highlight it again. So again, I'm holding down control, I highlight it again, it gets removed. So that's exactly what we want. So in this case, we know that every one of our bottoms here is going to be a pin support. So we want to restrict translation in X, we want to restrict translation in Y, but we want it to be able to rotate. So I'm just going to click this, and as we can see, it is now deactivated. I go OK now, and I were to highlight my bottom here, as we can see, we have now added pins to each one. So now we are actually good to go. From here, if we were to compare this frame that we have right now to our actual example frame, they are now identical. So we can actually move on to loading. One last thing before we do, because I know that some students will probably pick up and notice this. They'll say, hey, Clayton, what happened to your moment releases here? Before we had the little red lines, but now they're gone. Well, every time we go into a new tab, it's actually going to not show what is previous to it. For example, if I were to go back to the members tool, as we can see, our boundary conditions have now disappeared. If I were to go back to my boundary conditions, well, then they appear again. However, some students, including myself, do not like this. <laughs> so basically what I like to do down here is we can toggle what stays on no matter what window you're in. So if I always want these boundary conditions to be shown, I can toggle them on right here. So now if I were to go back to my joint tool, as we can see, I can still see my pins. Same thing for the moment releases right beside it. I can click it on. And as we can see, we can always see the moment releases now, no matter what tab that we're actually in. So at this point, we're looking pretty good. Our frame's looking pretty sexy. Now it's time to start defining some of the loads. So now that we are completely done with geometry, we can go now to our loads tab. As we can see, all of our buttons have now changed and then our frame kind of disappeared. I have to zoom out a bit. You can zoom using the mouse wheel, and if you want to pan, you just hold down the mouse wheel, 
and you can basically get it to whatever you like. Notice again by default, once we change tabs, that all of our things are turned off again. So I can just click them back on to show what exactly our frame is. Now, when it comes to a linear analysis in CSA S16, remember that we actually have to consider multiple different load cases. We have to do a gravity load case and a translational load case. The nice thing in S-Frame is we can actually define multiple different load cases and analyze them all at once. So what I'm going to do is I can go up to this button right here and this says new load case. So I'm going to click it. It appears off screen, of course, I bring it over. And basically it says, what load case is this? Well, for this particular example, we know we have to start with a gravity load case. So actually I'll just go gravity. These gravitational factors would be something if you want to add self weight. And then if we want to, we can also scale our loads. So let's say that I put hundred kilonewtons on my frame. And then for fun, I want to analyze 200 kilonewtons. Well, rather than removing all the loads and then reapplying them, I could just scale by two. So nice and simple, but we're not doing any scaling. We're not considering any self weight. So I just leave everything as default. So from here I can go okay. And as we can see, we now have a load case defined, which is gravity. So now every load that I apply will actually be considered in the gravity load case. So this is where it kind of goes back to the theory where you have to remember that for a gravity analysis, we don't apply any lateral loads. We just want to apply our gravity loads. Now in our frame here, our only gravity loads are a distributed load that acts across the top of the frame of 50 kilonewtons per meter. So to add a distributed load, we have a tool right here called global load. So I'm going to click that right here. It has different types. So if I want it uniform, we have uniform. If I wanted it triangular, we can go partial varying, all that fun stuff. But of course, we're just doing full uniform. We know it's going to be acting in the Y direction. If you wanted X direction, you could have it as X. And we know that our load, of course, is going to be 50 kilonewtons. But keep in mind that for 50 kilonewtons, that would actually be orientated upwards. What we want is it going downwards. So this will be negative 50. So I type in negative 50, I go OK. And then all I have to do is select the members that it applies to. So we know that it applies here, it applies here, and it applies right here. So this is going to be our first load case, nice and simple. Now, before we get into the second load case, we have to remember that in CSA, we actually need some information from the gravity load case to move on to the lateral load case. Basically for the gravity load case, as you will all remember from the theory, is we actually have to restrict this frame from swaying. We actually have to add a support right here. I haven't done that yet because what I want you to see as students is that if I were to analyze it just under this gravity load, basically because this column right here is much stiffer than this column and the frame is not symmetric, the frame will actually have a natural tendency to sway. A lot of students don't see that. When they see purely vertical loads, they don't think it'll move in the horizontal direction. So before we add that roller over here, I just want to analyze this structure as is so you guys can see what would happen if we don't have the roller. Now to analyze a structure, all we have to do in S-Frame is just click this button right here, all these little dots right here. I click it and then S-Frame presents us with this menu right here. Basically, which load cases do you want to solve for? Well, we can go both by default. It'll include our gravity. This will start to change once we have multiple different load cases and combinations, and then it'll ask you for analysis type. So remember for CSA right now, we are doing linear static load cases. So our default option is the one we want. We can go okay. Once you do that, you guys will have this menu. Oh, it's quite big. <laughs> You'll have this menu up here, and this is basically just a check that it uses to make sure that everything is defined in the model. As we can see, we've defined everything correctly. We have no errors over here and we actually have one load case, we are good to go. This is great because let's say you forget to apply some supports or anything like that. This screen right here will tell you, hey, you forgot to apply some boundary conditions. So it's actually really good. As we can see, we have no errors. So all I actually have to do is just press enter. Once I press enter, it does everything. And as we can see, we are automatically thrown into the graphical window. Remember, I said at the beginning that this window is actually used for us to determine the results. So as we can see, we actually have nothing going on over here. 
And again, all of our things are turned off. So let me just turn on our boundary conditions. Let's turn on our moment releases, all that fun stuff. And what I can do is I can now use these tabs right here to look at different things. So the first one I want to show you guys, because again, I, I told you guys, this is what I want you to see, is if I were to go to this button right here, this is going to be the deflection tool. So remember right now, all we have is gravity loads. But if I were to look at the deflection, as we can see, our frame has that natural tendency under gravity loads to actually displace laterally. And in S16, if we're doing that simplified analysis, we can't have any swaying occurring during our gravity load analysis. So if we want to add that roller over here, it's actually pretty simple. All I have to do is go back to geometry, go back to my support conditions, and then add a roller right here. So right now we are at pins. If I only want to restrict horizontal translation, I can just toggle this to off. I can now select it and I can have my roller over here. Once I have this, everything else is the same because if I were to go back to loads, everything is still applied correctly, I can rerun the analysis. So I go back to my dots right here. As we can see, the menu always appears off screen. We are going to keep this the same. We can go okay, okay. I'm just doing the okays on the other screen. And basically now we have our analysis, including the roller. So if I were to look at my deflected profile right now, as we can see, our frame is not swaying anymore. Now this is important because remember for the S16 analysis, we need to take this reaction force and add it to our translation analysis. This is why we have to do the gravity load analysis first, so we can obtain this reaction force. To do that, all we have to do is go one below our deflected profile to this button right here. It says reactions tool. So if I were to click that right here, as we can see, we now have the reaction of 11.9 kilonewtons acting to the left. So when I do my translational analysis next, I'm actually going to have to add this right here to our translational analysis or our horizontal loads. Now, another thing that I want to show you guys really quickly is we can also look at different profiles. So right here, this button down below reaction tools, this is going to be, I'll just zoom out a bit, move it to the, move it to the right. This is our axial force diagram. If I were to go one below, we have our shear force diagram. And if I were to go one below that, we now have our moment diagram. Now this is gonna be important because another thing we need from this analysis is the first order moment and the first order axial load. That's gonna be very important. They are MFG and PFT in our actual calculations. Now in our example, we are concerned with this member right here. And it's kind of hard to see what's going on with this member because we have every other member active. What I can do is I can click this button right here and go unselect all. So notice that everything was now unselected. From here, I can go to this select tool on the side and I can just highlight the member that we want. So if I were to highlight this member and now go back to let's say moment diagram, it's only going to be displayed for this member right here, which is great. We can see at the bottom here, we have zero kilonewton meters. And at the top here, we have negative 191.9 kilonewton meters. So if I want to isolate a specific member, this is how you do it. Now, another thing that I kind of forgot to mention, but I'll, I'll tell you guys it now. If I were to go back to my deflection tool, as we can see, we now have the deflection, but you guys may have it going absolutely crazy because of the scaling factors. Of course, our frame isn't actually going to deflect this much. So as frame, what it does is it actually scales it so that we can see it with our eye. So if you guys want to make the scaling different things, we can go to settings, down to diagrams. And what I have for my scaling factors, you guys will probably have automatic scaling, which is why it probably looks very gross. But if you want to, you can specify max projected length and I have minus 15. So if you want the same scaling as me, just go 15, good to go. Now, one last thing really quick before we move on to the translational analysis is if I want to analyze this member more in depth rather than just using a legend, I can right click this member and I can go down to properties. Once I do that, this appears over here. And as we can see, we can now analyze the axial force, the shear force, the moment at different stations. By default, I have 10 stations going on. So it does the calculations at 10 different points. But if you want, you can increase this all the way up to 100. So you can do a more in-depth analysis. So again, 
If you guys are doing the simplified procedure in CSA, you want three things. You want the bending moment distribution along this member. You want the axial force distribution along this member. So as we can see, it's negative 409 kilonewtons or 409 kilonewtons in compression. And then also don't forget that we also want this reaction force. So what I can do is I can click this button here, which will highlight everything in my structure. And I go back to this reaction force and we have 11.9. So now that we have that 11.9 written down, we can actually move on to the translational analysis. So what I can do is I can go back to my loads tab and I can say, okay, this was my gravity load analysis, but now I want a translational one. So I'm going to click this right here, which is a new load case, and it pops up on the other screen. And from here, I want a translational, translational load case. Again, I'm going to leave everything default and I'm going to go OK. So notice that for this load case, it removed all the vertical loads. If I were to go back to the gravity load, it still has everything applied. But now I'm going to go to my translational load case. Now for the translational load case, we actually have to do a couple things. The first one is we have to remove this roller right here. To do that, we go to the geometry, we go back to our support conditions tool. And again, if I want to remove something, all I have to do is hold down control and highlight it. So I have control held down, I highlight it, it now removes my roller, I'm good to go. I'm going to go back to my load case and we know that we are applying a lateral load going towards the left. So this button right here is for our lateral, or sorry, our distributed load. But if I want to apply just a concentrated point load, I go up to this button right here called the joint load. If I were to click that right here, we have a couple different options. We can apply it in the Y direction, but we know we want to actually apply it in the X direction. So I'm going to change it to X force, and then I have to specify a magnitude. Now, the first thing is, is since we want it going left, we have to go negative. S frame follows that conventional sign convention. So if we want something going left, we have to put negative. And the other key thing here is that the magnitude of this load is going to be the summation of three different things. The first one is our applied lateral load, which is 30 kilonewtons. The second one is our notional load, which we calculated as six kilonewtons. So right now we're at 36. The final thing we have to add to it is that reaction force from the gravity analysis. So remember from the gravity analysis that we just did, we had 11.9 kilonewtons. So we have to add that too. That gives us a grand total of 47.9 kilonewtons. So I'm going to go 47.9 kilonewtons, again acting left. I'm going to go OK, and then I can now add it to this joint right here. And this is it for my translational analysis. So what I can do is I can say, OK, now that this is good to go, I can now analyze my structure yet again. So again, go up to the dot tool, I click it, I bring this over. Again, we're also doing a linear static analysis. We go okay, and after we run the analysis, we get this right here, and we can analyze the deflections in our frame. Now the translate, or sorry, the gravity analysis, we wanted that reaction force. In the translational analysis, what we want are these story deflections. So as we can see, we have the deflected shape, but we actually don't have the deflections at these stories. In order to turn those on or toggle them on, we go up to these tools right here. So if I want to see X directions or X displacements, I click here. If I want Y displacements, I click here. Or if I want rotations, I click here. We know that we actually want horizontal displacements. So if I were to click that right here, we now have the displacement at each one of these joints. Now this is important because remember, when we're calculating that U2 amplification factor in S16, we need that delta. This is where the delta comes from. It's going to be the maximum of these story deflections. So as we can see here, we have 41.7, 41.7, 41.9, and 42. So this is the maximum one right here, 42 millimeters. So what I would do is I would write that down in my S16 calculations, and then I would also write down the moment and axial load profile of this right here. So again, if I want to just single out this member, what I can do is I can unselect all the members, and then I can come back over here and only highlight my member of interest. From here, I can look at its axial load, which is 35.9 kilonewtons. And remember that 
S frame follows that conventional sign convention. So since this is a positive value, this column right here is actually in tension. It's very important to note that. If I were to come over to my bending moment profile, we have it again. And notice here that the moment is positive 165. In our other analysis, it was negative. So as we can see, the gravity and translational analysis, they actually counteract each other. And when you go watch that example video where we do the hand calculations, we are going to see that the total moment is actually very small on this column because again, the gravity and translation counteract one another. So this point right here in the analysis, we have every single thing that we need to conduct our hand calculations, right? We are good to go. So this is where the video will end for most of you. However, some students will say, well, you know what, Clayton, S16 has a very nice clause that says, instead of doing these two first order analysis, I can just do one second order analysis. And you are completely correct. So if we want to do just the second order analysis and skip all the hand calculations, what we can do is we can go back to our loads and we can define kind of a total load. It's important to note that in a complete analysis, we have to include both the gravity load as well as the horizontal load. Our geometry of the frame isn't going to change, so we can leave that constant. What I can do is I can define a new load case. Pop it over to the side, and let's say that we want a second order analysis. I can go OK. Now, in a second order analysis, again, we need to include all applied loads. So we know that we have that gravity load of negative 50 kilonewtons per meter. So I'm going to go back to our global load. By default, it'll have it saved as whatever you had last. So it's already at negative 50. I can go OK and I can select it here, here and here. And we know that we have an applied horizontal load. Now, this is going to be one trick. So please don't fall for this. This horizontal load that we apply, it is not the negative 47.9. It is not. So if I were to go back to my joint load before we applied negative 47.9. If we are doing a complete second order analysis, this load right here is just going to be the applied loads plus the notional loads. That's it. Applied loads and the notional load. That is it. That 47, that amplification of 11.9 kilonewtons, that was to account for these second order effects. But if we're actually doing a complete second order analysis, well, the program's going to do that for us. So again, we wouldn't include that reaction force. So we know that this load is going to be the applied load, which is negative 30, plus the notional load, which was negative six. So this will be in total negative 36 kilonewtons. Again, we do not add that reaction force in a second order analysis. I go okay, and I can add it here. Now, some of you guys may be looking at this and say, Clayton, I don't understand. Where did your gravity load go? Well, remember that we have the different toggles. So if I want to see all my loads, I would have to toggle both of them on. So as we can see for a second order analysis, I define the frame completely. I add our gravity load, and then I add our applied horizontal load plus our notional load. From here, I go back to our analysis button, which I click right here. This pops up, and this is going to be the only difference. Instead of going linear static, we now want a P delta static analysis. So this right here, will take into account all of those P delta effects that we want. So I go that, I go okay, it runs the checks off screen, I go okay. And now as we can see, we now have our complete frame analysis. We can see all of the deflections, we can see the shear profile, I'll move this to the side a bit. We can see the axial force profile, and we can see the bending moment diagram. Now this kind of goes to what I was saying before where they counteracted each other. So if I were to unselect all and now just look at this member right here and look at the bending moment, as we can see, it's very small. It's only 8.4 kilonewton meters. Again, the reason why this became so small is in the gravity analysis, it was negative, but in the translational analysis, it was positive. So when you add them together, they actually counteracted one another. But yeah, that's it. That's how you do a second order analysis. So that's it for this tutorial. Hopefully it wasn't too bad. I know it kind of gets a little bit long, but I'll add chapters to hopefully ease your suffering. Again, all we did here was we wanted to get the values we needed for our hand calculations in CSA S16. If you're more interested in those hand calculations themselves, 
go down to the description below. I will have the video linked where we actually go over all of those hand calculations. But yeah, that's it for this video. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in the next S-Frame example.